What's up, fellas? Long time no see. Happy to see everybody again for another episode of the podcast provided by BGO. You can find us at bgobsession.com. Please feel free to like and subscribe on the YouTube channel as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I'll warn you now, if you follow us on Twitter, it's John, and you're going to feel it, hear a lot about UVA and some other things we might not have to get into tonight. But tonight we are gathered here today to break down some tight end prospects. Day before yesterday, you should see a drop, or well, maybe late, late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. You'll see the pod, if you haven't seen it, about breaking down some wide receiver prospects that we broke into. So today we'll get into tight ends. If you guys are ready, I sh probably should have queued this up before now, but we'll go ahead and roll. I can jump into it. One of you guys needs to lead off next week. That's all I'm saying, John. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Jatavion Sanders. Um, selfishly, I jumped on this guy, but admittedly, I've been watching him for a couple weeks for a couple months now. Uh, he was an easy choice as he's widely viewed as being the second best tight end in this class behind Brock Bowers. Couple uh couple statistics on this guy. 6'4, 245. He ran a 46940 at the combine. Um he has been described as the prototypical pass catching tight end. All of his concerns are regarding inline blocking. Uh, in fact, I've even seen reports draft buzz has a has him under strengths, excellent open field blocker, but under weaknesses, he is a less than ideal inline blocker. Uh, so he's the kind of guy that you can flex out, you can put him outside, you can run behind him, around him. You just don't want him protecting your quarterback's blind side. But that's not what you're drafting Jatavion Sanders for. Um, in 2023, he was uh, uh, as a senior at Texas. He had 45 catches for 682 yards. That's a 15.2 average and two touchdowns. And that was actually a season where he was dealing with some injuries. The biggest thing that I got excited about, one, he's already scheduled to a top 30 visit here with us. Uh, so that either means they're interested or they're completely trying to throw the scent off. And uh, the other thing is, first team all Big 12 in 2022. Uh, he did not have that honor in 23. But when he was actually recruited to Texas, his coach said he was talented enough to play both ways, that he could have lined up at tight end and at edge. And then an additional little no a, a little notch in his uh, – feather in his cap is he was actually a wide receiver in high school and he set all kinds of stupid records i think i saw one his senior year i think he had like 1600 yards receiving or something crazy so um big strong guy uh he is not gonna be an inline blocker but he is fast i've seen him described as being a guy that that linebackers can't cover and dbs can't catch or can't out jump so where where exactly he falls in the line of the uh, the draft status? I've seen him mocked early second. He could go late first. I think it's going to really depend on wide receivers and tackles. Uh, wide receivers and tackles might end up dominating the first round, which could push some more guys deeper. I think he'll be there at thirty six. If he's there at thirty six, and we don't go tackle, this is the kind of guy that I would circle with it. Um, Super soft hands, rarely drops any passes. And he has really strong hand usage, so he's able to get off the line. He can beat press coverage. Um, it's effective after the catch. Uh, show and it, it even says that he can, he shows potential as a screen receiver that can take it the distance. So split him wide, run him outside, play X, keep him in the slot, line him up at your traditional tight end as long as you're not asking him to block. Uh, I think he's going to be a pretty, pretty versatile weapon in the NFL. Uh, and I think he's going to be able to step in day one wherever he gets drafted and have an immediate impact. The last thing I wanted to point out, John, you'll enjoy this. His comps are Dalton Kincaid and Trey McBride. I think John talked about both of those guys with with a, in previous podcasts where we were breaking down the tight end position and some of our wish lists. Uh, and then additionally, Michael Mayer, who I think was 
highly touted as I one of the top tight ends in last year's draft. So if you're in that kind of company, uh, that's that's a pretty outstanding weapon. I'm sold. Hey, come on. Next up, we got Ben Sinat. Sinat. Somebody tell me how to pronounce that. Cause yeah, Sinato. Ben Sinat. There you go. Um, so tight end out of Kansas State. Uh, he was one of one of my selections. Uh, he's got pretty good size for a tight end. He's 6'4", 254 pounds. Uh, he was a tight end and slash fullback hybrid uh, at Kansas State and over the course of his uh, college career there. Being a Canadian guy, it was easy for me to gravitate towards a hockey player. Uh, ben Sinat was a hockey player at a very early age. Uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of the type of football player he is, all you got to do is look at his hockey statistics as a young child. He led his team in penalty minutes, but he also led his team in points. And it pretty much sums up what you're getting with Ben Sinat. You're getting a well-rounded tight end who can do a little bit of everything. Uh, he's a two-time all, all Big 12 player. Uh, he actually won something called the Low Man Award in 2023 as as the nation's top fullback. I didn't know that that existed. Um, what I really like about this kid is he's shown some steady improvement as a player. Um, his freshman season, he only had two receptions. 2022, he had 28 catches for 399 yards. Uh, by 2023, uh, he improved to 48 catches for almost 700 receiving yards and six touchdowns. Uh, he had a QB, a QB ratings were 105.3 when he was targeted. So, I mean, the guy's had a pretty steady climb and he's put up, put up some pretty decent numbers. Um, his strengths, obviously, I, I kind of alluded to it. His versatility is what is going to attract teams to him. Uh, he can be your inline traditional tight end. He, you can line him up in the slot. Um, you know, you can use them in stacked formations or you can even use them as an H back. Um, so in that regard, he can be, I guess, a little bit of a unpredictable player and an unpredictable guy to cover. Um, I really like the fact that he's got a brain and intellect. Uh, he's, he's perceived as having really good processing skills. He's played in all sorts of different formations and alignments. So I think that he'd be able to step into an NFL roster and not be overwhelmed. And I think that's important for young guys coming into the league. Um, he's considered to have pretty good speed and acceleration. He'll be someone who can get off the line quickly and he can cover a lot of ground with his, you know, first few initial steps. Um, that being said, he's not someone who has like that top end speed. He's not going to be field stretcher or not going to be someone, um, you know, who can, who has that, uh, change of direction ability. So basically he's not going to make people miss in the open field type thing. Um, I talked about his hockey career earlier. Uh, I love the fact that he loves to get downfield and block. So he's one of those guys that is just not afraid to get his hands dirty. And I think that every NFL roster could be served having players like that. Um, all in all, I think he can just be the type of player that can be an asset on every down. I don't think this is going to be a superstar player by any means, but just a well-rounded tight end and a well-rounded player that can serve a lot of purposes. Um, and at the end of the day, I think he can be another tool in the box in the toolbox for Kingsbury to utilize and figure out um, a, a way to maximize his potential with. So that's what I got on Ben Sinat. Next up, Cade Stover. If he had a neck, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason for that. Stover was originally was originally recruited to OSU as a linebacker, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and after a year at linebacker, he moved to defensive end. <laughs> and he after he played a street cone, yeah. <laughs> and and after he played defensive end, he played his final two seasons at tight end. Those are the only two seasons this guy has at tight end in his career. <laughs> nothing in high school and nothing prior to his junior year at OSU. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a certain level of adaptability here, obviously. I mean, he's got enough athleticism that the coaches were looking for someplace to get him on the field, which I consider to be a pretty positive sign. However, as you, as I'm sure is pretty obvious simply by the time frame, the guy's going to be fairly raw. 
uh, I'm seeing him rated in a lot of places as like the third or fourth best tight end in this class, which I find interesting. It's got to be off, you know, athleticism. And yet everybody says he doesn't have a single elite athletic trait that he can fall back on. He's got pretty solid hands. Uh, his history as a defender um, helps him in terms of reading the defense pre-snap. The guy's probably going to be in line, but he doesn't block particularly well yet. He's got the physical attributes for it. He's 6'4", 247, and can probably put some, you know, put some size on beyond that, obviously. But he's also not a particularly fast guy, right? 4'6", 5", so he's not going to run away from the defense. But he does a pretty good job of finding it, finding his way into, you know, into soft spots in the defense. It, and developed a reputation as a clutch third down and red zone guy in his two years at OSU or two years at tight end, I guess I should say at OSU. So fascinating character. I I'm trying to figure out what I think of him watching the tape of him. He looks pretty good, but I mean, he does a lot of the same things over and over again, uh, probably because of that lack of experience at the position. Uh, and I'm wondering I'm wondering about his, you know, his, his football smarts and, and, you know, whether or not the, this whole thing is going to translate to the NFL, but man, he's got a lot of the physical tools. One thing I, I, I meant to start off with, and then, uh, and then Derek sidetracked me with the neck joke. Um, I went and looked up Adam Peters history of drafting tight ends at San Francisco, because I was kind of curious They've drafted five tight ends in his time there. They drafted two last year, by the way, um, and and never won before the third round. And the household name that everybody knows there, George Kittle, they found in the fifth round. So I'm not going to be surprised at all if we're not picking tight end until day three of this draft. And of course, a lot of that's going to depend on who's available when, right? I mean, they may love Sanders, but if Sanders disappears between our first pick and our second pick, um, you know, there you go. And, I like and he pretty well could from what Derek has said. So I think some of these lower guys may well, may well be guys we're looking at too. So there you go. That's what I got. Next up from the uh from T T E U, right? Should we just rename Iowa T E U at this point? Because it just seems like every year they just pump out the next guy. Is that Eric All? Is that right? Yes. Was that a gavel? No, it was my water bottle. I've got the wrong notes up. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, the old school failed. I was using the order that they were provided to me in. I got it. <clears throat> um yes, Eric All. By the way, um, I'm pinch hitting tonight for Brother Mark, uh, who loves to do this stuff and put in all the work and and then not didn't have the, the glory, didn't have the ability to uh, to make the screening tonight because of um, personal issues. So I'm going to pass along what uh, he sent to me, and then I'm going to give you his take, his opinion. Um, so I have no absolutely no responsibilities here. <laughs> um, Chris is Chris is washing his hands of the whole thing. He's quite literally an actor. If he especially, if he sucks, it's not my fault. Especially on this candidate, um, Eric All, Iowa, six foot four, two hundred and fifty two pounds. He's a red shirt senior. Um, he played four mich four years at Michigan before transferring to uh, Iowa for his red shirt senior season. Notable is that he missed most of 2022 with a back injury, played three games and was out the rest of the season. And then last year he tore his ACL in October. Uh, his strengths are he has reliable hands and shows the willingness to make catches in traffic over the middle. He looks to get involved downfield and will block multiple defenders. He understands his role as a blocker. He varies the speed of his routes using hesitation and shoulder fakes to get defenders guessing. He has strong hands and is, an ext and is extremely competitive, and he has the innate sense of timing when it comes to elevating and high pointing balls. His limitations are that he's largely a non factor downfield and has issues with drops and tracking the ball. 
He's more quick than fast. He, his 40 time is a 4.8. And he won't always be able to run away from NFL defenders. He really isn't a guy who will create much separation. And he'll have to develop a better feel for sitting down against zone coverage. Mark's take, coming off injury, only 10 games played in the last two seasons. So if it's determined that he's healthy, he could be a good value. Probably never an elite pass catching threat, but looks like a solid tight end two or tight end three option with potential to rise. He's not going to wow you with athleticism, but will impress you with his football smarts. He runs clean routes, finds space, sits down, makes himself a big target, and he has good hands. Basically, he's a football player. Kind of reminds me of former Dallas tight end Jason Witten. Mm -hmm. mock, <clears throat> mock draft projections place him anywhere from the fifth round down but I think he might go higher. And that is Eric Hall. All right. Next up, Dallin Holker. Is that right? Holker? Yeah. And so he looks like a tight end. He does look <laughs> like a tight end. It's Dallin, uh, Dallin Holker. He actually looks like a guard, but that's just. So uh, most, the two guys that I'm going to talk about tonight are both kind of mm. more project guys. Um, partially because I picked last <laughs> on the tight end candidates, but also because I don't think this is a super deep tight end class. And so therefore I suspect if we do draft a tight end, it's going to be more of a project guy later on. Um, but that's just a guess. Um, so Dallin Holker, uh, is uh, played at Colorado state. He's got good size, six, four, 241 pounds pretty fast. I mean, he ran a 4.7840. That's that's trucking pretty good for a guy that size. Uh he actually played for BYU for 3 seasons and I'm being generous by saying he played for BYU because he really didn't play much. <laughs> uh, he was kind of stuck on the roster and then the his last season he transferred to Colorado State. And I think it's noteworthy that the guy transfers to Colorado State for his final year of football. They make him a team captain, which right out of the get, gate, that's impressive to me because he obviously made a pretty quick and strong impression. And he was also a finalist for the Mackey Award for the best tight end uh, in the country in that one season, uh, which was really his only statistically noteworthy season. Um, he In 2023, he had 64 catches, 767 yards, and six touchdowns. That's pretty good for a, a college tight end. That's a, a hell of a season. He's got really good ball skills, um, decent speed, very tough ones can win contested uh, balls. He's got long arms, really big hands, a big catch radius. So he's kind of one of these guys that's as wide as he is tall. Um, he's very good in the middle of the field. And that's why I think he could be a target if he's not snatched up somewhere on day three because he's really super solid in the middle, in this middle of the field uh, where you want that safety net tight end to help to bail out your young quarterback. Um, very tough kid makes uh, loves to make catches in traffic. He's tough. He's, I mean, for the guys that are trying to cover him, it's a seismic and a strength mismatch. And the other thing I really liked about uh, Dallin Holker was uh, the vast majority of his production comes in the second half. So he gets better and better as the game goes on, the more, the more opportunities he gets, not the strongest blocker. Um, but he is a very mature kid. He is already married. He's definitely, if you watch any of his interviews, he's a, he's a man of faith. Um, and so he probably didn't go to BYU by mistake. Um, and trivia note for the future, uh, he he eats a Snickers bar as his pregame routine. So <laughs> that's what I got on Dolan Holker. But I think he could be a he could be a really um, solid player that's available um, to the mid mid to the late third day. Very cool. So I guess I'm a little hair going. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. That is great hair. Uh, before I move on, I will say again: if you're still hanging with us, please like and subscribe to the YouTube page. 
Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course at bgobsession.com. Uh join the join the board, get on, comment. We love comments going back and forth. Everybody here is an a- very active members of the board. So uh mix it up. All right. So on to my personal draft. He might be my my crush this year. Um, this is a sleeper pick from all sleeper picks. Tip Ryman, okay. Couple things on Tip Ryman. Six five two seventy one. I've listed I've seen him listed as high as two seventy five. Wow. This is a big hoss, okay? He looks like Kirk Cousins evil twin, man. <laughs> all he did at the combine was run a four six four forty. Okay. At two seventy? At two seventy five, he ran a four six four forty. Okay. This guy, Draft Buzz, has him listed as a sixth round pick and an inline blocking tight end. But here's the I'm gonna give you the scouting report on Draft Buzz with the strengths. Here's the strengths. Good quickness off the snap, has good speed for the position to attack the seam, shows burst out of his breaks and gain separation. Has enough speed to challenge the seam, but does not process elite top end speed. Good burst off the snap. Quick hands and good balance to gain a clean release. A big bodied and sure handed underneath target. He's a fluid mover and Ryman shows good sense as a route runner. He has coordinated hands. Ca- He's a coordinated hands catcher who does a nice job digging out low throws. He's very good with the ball in his hands. A violent runner after the catch and often able to fend off defenders with a straight arm. He's a fluid athlete with excellent short area quickness. He should be able to create separation. And they're lining him up as an inline blocking tight end. That's their scouting report. And they're saying he's an inline blocking tight end. Illinois was one of the worst offenses in the country last year. So I'm wondering if it was a product of that. Because didn't they have a game against Iowa that ended 9-6 to six or something stupid? Like it was one of the worst football games in history. <laughs> um so never mind, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit about my guy tip ryman and what made what really got me excited about him he watches george kittle to help as a blocker that's where he he models his game after george kittle okay he in high school he was an outside linebacker and edge defender who was recruited by San Diego and San Diego State, as well as a couple Division I schools. His senior year, there was an opening at tight end that they needed filled, and he switched to tight end, even though he was being recruited to go to school as a defensive end outside linebacker. He did it just to fill the need for his high school football team. Wow. At that point, multiple schools bailed. When he actually graduated, there were no FBS offers until his grandfather, who happened to be a real estate agent, sent his film to a client of his named Rod Smith, who happened to be the offensive coordinator at Illinois. Illinois then granted him a preferred walk-on spot. His freshman year, he did not. He appeared in one game with no stats. His saw his redshirt freshman year. He played in twelve games. He had three catches. In twenty two, his sophomore season, he had thirteen games. He had nineteen catches, one hundred seventy four yards. Going into twenty three, he was voted team captain. So he went from walk on to team captain, where he played in twelve games. He only had nineteen catches for two hundred three yards and three touchdowns. This guy, like, if this guy is the sleeper of all sleepers, like, I, 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 I am hitching my wagon to tip Ryman. I don't, I, I can't explain why he is not getting more respect. That size, that speed, that, that, that scouting report, and the guy didn't get thrown the football. Maybe they just had a terrible quarterback or offense. I don't know, but it's this because is my he, dude sounds right like here. he sounds like a fake Seinfeld character, like Kel Varnson or Art Vandelay or H. <laughs> It's like eight, tight end H.E. Penny Packer <laughs> fighting a line eye. To this guy, he he threw up 28 reps and bench at the combine. That is 98. I mean, he looks like a beast. 98th percentile in tight ends. He's Jeez. 77th percentile in the shuttle, 92nd percentile in weight, 93rd percentile in 10. 
in his 10 yard split with his 10 yard split was a one five five, which means he went from no yards to 10 yards in 1.55 seconds. That's wide receiver speed acceleration. This is my dude right here. This is who I am. I'm hitching my wagon to for 2024. It's, it says cool. cornflakes without opening the box. That's I, it just, <laughs> he, he, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Derek, does does this mean that we're going to see tip in your uh, in your draft prediction for the for the competition on the he's board? He's not only just going to be in my draft prediction. He's in my draft. What is that thread? What is it? What is it? Uh, my draft crush. Draft crush. Okay, he's he's gonna be in the twenty twenty four draft crush. I dropped Jatavia Sanders in there today, <laughs> but Tip Ryman's gonna be in there. All right, enough oogling and googling. Next up is Jaheim Bell out of Florida State. How many Florida State guys we got? Quite a few. Yeah, so I have uh, Jaheim Bell. Um. I guess a little bit of uh, the same type of player as Ben Sinat. Um, that being said, this would definitely be like a day three guy uh, with the, with Sinat out of Kansas state. He's projected more as like a possibly late day two guy. Bell is definitely one of those day three project type players. Um, he's definitely not tip Ryman. He's only six, two and 244 pounds. Um, it's actually the same height and weight as Jordan Reed, which I found pretty interesting. Um, he played uh, initially at South Carolina, uh, but he transferred to Florida State last season and uh, I guess was a pretty or fairly important piece of the puzzle that helped them to uh, achieve status as one of the best teams in college football last year. Um, his statistics are never going to you know, floor you or wow you. Uh, his best season came last season in Florida State. 40 catches, 503 yards. So he's not like a high volume guy by any means. Um, he's considered to have pretty good speed. He's considered to be a type of player that can break up, break off some chunk plays for you. Um, he can get up the field vertically. Um, he's a pretty solid pass catcher. That is his bread and butter and what he excels at. Thought to be a really natural athlete and someone who can be effective all over the field. So I talked about a little bit about that with Sinat, and this is the same type of player in that regard. Um, he's got some ability in space if you get the ball in his hands. Uh, I really like the fact that he's got some really good physicality and competitive toughness. I think that kind of fits the identity we're trying to establish, both on offense and on defense in Washington. I'm keeping my fingers crossed and hoping that that is the identity we establish. Um, he can add some wrinkles to your offense. Uh, his... His final season at South Carolina before he went to uh, Florida State, he actually had 71 rushing attempts uh, for hmm. 261 yards. Um, so he's he's obviously he's not a volume guy in the passing game, but he's one of those chess pieces, so to speak. Um, you know, he's a versatile guy. You can play H back. You can put him in the slot. You can even motion him out wide type thing. Um, you know, so he has a variety of tools and you can use them a variety of different ways. Um, don't look for this guy to block for you. It's not going to happen. That's not what you're getting with them. Um, you know, he, he definitely needs to uh, develop and refine his technique as a blocker in the NFL. So in that regard, he's definitely a developmental project. Um, he's not going to make an instant impact for you, likely. But in spot scenarios, if you give him a specific role, he can be one of those players that can spark your offense. Um, you know, and in a, mar in a, in a modern NFL offense, I think there's, there's a role for those types of players. Um, I would be intrigued to see what Kingsbury can do with a guy like this, um, especially in what will likely be uh, a pass heavy offense. And I think John, you may have alluded to that last week as well, that that was part of your belief. Um, he's, he, he was a guy that had a really impressive senior bowl. But that being said, as I already said, he's your he's a day three player. Um, who knows? Maybe we draft a more traditional tight end in this draft, but maybe we also add a flex option at the position, um, given the fact that the cupboard is really bare in Washington uh, in the tight end department. So if that is the line of thinking, uh, maybe a guy like Jaheim Bell 
is an option for us. That's what I got on them. A lot of firepower coming out of Florida State. Yeah. And you still got Trey Benson. As the yeah, I was about to say, and we haven't even talked about the running back yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Next up, Jared Wiley, TCU. Yeah, Mr. Wiley. So, fifth year senior. He spent his first three years at uh, at University of Texas and had issues working his way up the depth chart. I think after listening to Derek talk about Sanders, you can probably understand why that last year that, that Wiley was there. So, he spent his last two years at TCU. Um, Over the two years at TCU, he's got 68 catches for 750 yards and 15 touchdowns, give or take, something like that. The thing that really stands out, though, is when he's targeted, his quarterbacks have uh, a quarterback rating of over 109. Um, So the dude's the dude's pretty reliable uh, as far as getting his hands on the football. Um, Every review I read noted his football intelligence. He's really good at finding the soft spot in the zone, setting up and giving his quarterback a target, using his body as a as a defensive shield against the def- to keep the defenders off the ball. He's also the only tight end I've taken a look at in, in this, you know, in this year's draft where they actively talked about his blocking. Um, I mean, in a good way, right? Under the strengths category as opposed to the weaknesses category. Um, he was noted as being particularly good at the point of attack and being really good once he gets, you know, once the play moves on to the second level, he manages to take care of his first guy and move on to the second level and do a pretty good job at the second level as well to, to create space for his running back. Um, it, I flipped that around a weaker, you know, an issue with his blocking. Apparently he's got weaker hands. It doesn't turn up in his pass game. Um, he doesn't have a problem hanging onto the football there, but in his blocking game, he's got weaker hands, causes an issue with hanging on to guys, uh, and and he does sometimes doesn't manage to hold the block as long as as maybe uh, coach would like. Um, he also doesn't transition from receiver to runner well, so there aren't a lot of yards after the catch. Uh, he manages to bring the football in really well, and even though he shows tremendous athleticism, uh, there's just something about making the transition from I'm catching the football to I'm running with the football that he hasn't managed to to add to his game yet at this point in time. Um, but he's projected to be, you know, a late third round guy. And he may be somebody we look at in the sixth or seventh round if we haven't already got a, you know, a tight end by that point in time. So that's Jared Wiley for you. Jared, he looks like a badass. Doesn't you know that dude that like this guy number here right here number twenty five, he's a DB. He's a corner. You can already like body language. He's like I I I don't know if I want to hit this guy. <laughs> <laughs> like it's coming down. Well, and and you look at Wiley's face and Wiley's already checking him out. Yeah, he's, he's, look, he's like I'm gonna, right put my, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put nineteen right between your chest plate and separate you from your cleats. Next up, Theo Johnson. Theo Johnson, senior out of Penn State, six foot six, 260 pounds. And he is another plus athlete, not plus plus, but he's a plus athlete. Overall, he possesses standout athletic traits, but displays absolutely elite explosiveness. At 260 pounds, he ran a 4.57 in the 40 and had a vertical leap of 39 and a half inches. Uh, at the combine. He also had uh, elite scores in the 10 yard and in the broad jump. He's an athlete. Um, he creates separation through both physicality and through refined route running, shows superior capabilities in both run blocking and pass protection, can be deployed as both an inline and a flexed out receiver, exhibits exceptional hands and body control able to secure catches at various depths and adjust to passes with ease. He's effective in the red zone, leveraging his frame and athletic traits to outmatch defenders. He exhibits creativity after the catch to extend plays and to maximize yardage. He was a team captain. He also stood out at the senior bowl as uh, one of the top uh, players at his position in that game. 
mark state. This one is just a, this one is a just have a feeling thing. He's not particularly dynamic or fierce on the field at first blush, but he's also not shy about using his size and is a better athlete than I think first impressions give. Seems to have a knack for getting open, finds the soft spots, makes the catches smoothly. A big old solid target to deploy on third downs and red zone plays where he's a matchup nightmare. A man that big with a nearly 40 inch vertical is unnatural and size can't be coached. If he can be focused and fired up with NFL coaching, he has a chance to be a guy. Um, most draft projections have him being available between the third and the fifth rounds. I think he might go as high as a late second. Theo Johnson. You, uh, I really felt Mark again in that one. <laughs> a channel. <laughs> Next up, we have Trey Knox, Arkansas. Last up. <laughs> Next and last. Bring us so, home. I was going to talk about uh, a young man named Brevin Spanford, and if Brevin's mom is watching, please don't be upset. But the guy is a physical beast. He's 6'6", 260. Uh, he's a physical – I mean, he's a he's a specimen. Who? But before I started looking at him, Brevin Spanford – from Minnesota. But the more I started looking at him, you know, he can't hold on to the ball. And I'm like, I can't spend three minutes uh, promoting a guy that can't catch the ball. We've, we've already been there and done that uh, at tight end. It seems like for a long time. So, or can't stay on the field. So anyway, I'm going to talk about another guy uh, who's more of, again, a project type player could be a late round pick could even be an undrafted free agent, but he kind of, when I was reading about him, Trey Knox, um, I, I kind of got Don Warren vibes, just the way that he plays. And I don't know if some of you weren't alive, uh, you know, recently enough to or late enough to remember Don Warren. But Don Warren played for like 13 seasons and never had – I think he had one season of 30 or more catches. Hold on, John. Before you move on, I got to call you out, man. What's that? Why is our Forbes. boy getting handled in this picture right here? <laughs> Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped right out at me. Uh, it's because of his skinny uh, calves, man. If he keep those calves up, he wouldn't get it, getting pushed around like that. Yeah, I didn't catch that. That's a great catch. Ah, hell. All right. <laughs> Try Knox. So, so Knox is a project. He's 6'3", 240 pounds, played four years at Arkansas, and then transferred to South Carolina for whatever reason. Not the fastest guy in the world, which is why he's not, uh, he's, you know, he's going to be a late rounder. Um, in 2023, he played in 10 games, had 37 catches, 312 yards for two touchdowns. But the big reason I like him is because he's got the, he's only been a tight end since 2022. And yet he still put up good numbers and impressed, uh, especially towards the end of his time uh, that last season at South Carolina. Really good in the open field. I mean, he kind of plays like a wide receiver, but he's he's more of a spark plug type and very physical. And again, the physical part is what jumped out at me. If we're going to take a flyer on a guy, you want those guys that are going to smash somebody in the mouth, take the ball away if the ball's not perfectly thrown. Um, he also didn't really play a very comp complex route tree at either Arkansas or South Carolina. So... I think the thought process would be that, look, he's got wide receiver skills, a tight end body, really tough, and he hasn't really been coached as a tight end. So he's got a high – I think he's got a higher ceiling than maybe uh, you might typically think of for someone being drafted late. Um, he's he's was really strong in the red zone at South Carolina uh, because of that size, and he's a good jumper. And, again, just being a tough guy who, who can take the ball away from other – other receivers. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of tired of us drafting six, six tight ends who can't stay on the field. Um, we've done a lot of that over the last 15 years, you know, gone, we've always leaned towards the prototypical. I'm a pass catching tight end. I'm sick of that. I want a George Kittle type. That's going to bowl people over and smash them in the mouth and, and can block. Um, that's just what I'm looking for. So anyway, Trey Knox, who we may never hear of him again. 
<laughs> but I kind of like them. I like it. Well, fellas, it's been a pleasure running down this list of tight ends. So I think our, actually, if you go back and you look at our history of the tight ends that we have circled on this podcast yeah. in previous years, we're actually, we've got some hits. Like, we're, yes. we're usually pretty good about it. We should have drafted. Uh, they should have followed our advice last year because um, I think we picked Dalton Kincaid in our mock draft. I'm I went sure. through I went through on the board and posted, you know, I'm not trying to kick a dead horse or beat a dead horse, but I posted a bunch of we drafted this guy instead of this guy. Um, it's not good. <laughs> and, and I think there were like two or three tight ends or easy that weren't even first round tight ends. They were later in the draft tight ends that have turned out to be pretty quality players that those guys aren't even on our team anymore. But um, hmm. so, so next time out, we'll be talking uh, linebackers and defensive ends. So if you want to learn a little bit about the guys that we might be looking at, the commanders might be looking at, then tune in next time. Yep. And if you made it this far, thank you for listening again, like, and subscribe to the pod. Uh, we're we're moving in a different direction to hopefully make these things a little more appealing. So please jump on, uh, like, subscribe here, like and subscribe on uh, Twitter. Do it on Facebook and as well as on the website, bgobsession.com. Come by, join, mix it up. We enjoy having you. Night, boys. Good night. Good night.